Welcome to Exposure to Therapy. Today, my guest is Wayne McPhail, all the way from Hamilton, Ontario. He is a street photographer that documents a lot of really interesting stuff. And I'm really excited to take a look at his work today. Uh, Wayne, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. It's really fun. And you've uh, had some great guests on, so I feel uh, honored to be part of the Pantheon there. <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah, so um, for the audience listening, uh, when I signed on to the web, the app, I've been talking on stop about glass. Um, I saw Wayne's photos uh, of some of the unhoused population in Hamilton, and I noticed that he was sh shooting the same scenes that one of our previous guests had shot. Uh, and so I thought, no, oh, that was really interesting. So I reached out to Wayne. And um, anyways, that, that's how I got introduced to him. But uh, following his work, his street photography, uh, really, really uh, dig it and really excited to show you guys uh, today. But Wayne, before we get into your work, let's uh, talk about you a little bit. How did you start your whole photography journey? Where did it begin for you? I think, you know, I was thinking back on this and, and I, when I was a kid, um, I got a Diana camera. Uh, so like how we did the lomography before lomography was cool, um, you know, which was a, a cheap plastic camera. I can't even remember what film format it shot. If it was two and a quarter square or what it was. But anyway, I, I was shooting with that really badly. Uh, and I got quite interested in photography. Um, and then I sort of lost interest in it, I think, until uh, university. And then I started shooting uh, black and white in color. And I had a, a Eva Chrome kit and, you know, did black and white printing. Um, and so that really got me interested in photography. And I went to England for three months on a bike ride with a friend of mine. And a bike trip. It was a great trip. Uh, and we shot a lot of black and white then. Um, and then I came back and there was a new magazine in Hamilton, Ontario called Hamilton Magazine. And they were looking for a photographer. So I applied for the gig and, and got it, which I think was pretty easy. I don't think anybody else did. Um, and it was a great experience because I wasn't a great photographer at all, but they didn't <laughs> have great needs. And it was back then, it was on newsprint, it was black and white. And it was like, I, I, I tell folks, it was sort of like an Andy Hardy movie. Like, I've got a printing press, I've got an idea for a magazine, let's do one. Um, and so I just learned a ton about uh, color printing. They used to be a thing called Van Dykes, which were these sort of acetate overlays for the, the uh, different color layers in the magazine when it went to color. Um, so it was a great experience. And then, you know, over time I moved into doing what I was actually really good at, or I thought I was good at anyway at the time, which was writing, um, and became the managing editor of the magazine. And we actually hired real photographers to do photography. And, uh, <laughs> uh, that, again, that was a great experience learning from them, watching people in their studios and, and stuff. So then I guess the next sort of stage for me was I got really interested in digital photography in the 90s. I had a, I moved from Hamilton Magazine. I was a, a reporter and editor for the Hamilton Spectator. And then I got an opportunity to start a research and development lab on future, future information products for Southam. Um, and so early on, I got a good relationship with Apple Canada because Southam back then was an actual serious newspaper chain. It no longer exists, but back then it was, it was a player. And, uh, I got a, a, an opportunity to work with Apple and got hold of a Quick Take 100, uh, which was this really big camera, it looked like a binoculars almost, um, except with one lens. And it shot like uh, 640 by 480, and it was at so 85 top level of exposure. And it took a long time to bring a photograph in from a serial port, but I saw it was fantastic. You know, I just thought, this is great. I just love the idea. Um, shooting and being able to edit your pictures on your, your MacBook or PowerBook back then. Um, and I remember showing it to the photographers in the newsroom and they were sort of dismissive that it was a toy, you know, and this would, and, and, and so you could just see what you know, I, I got to see over the next four or five years, how quickly that toy sort of hockey sticked up into the, having the functionality of a, a normal uh, SLR. Um, so I got really interested in digital photography then and have kept it up and have done some professional gigs. I, I covered conferences for the Association of Science and Technology Centers in the U.S. and a woodworking conference. And I would go 
all over the U.S. and, and shoot their conferences, mostly candidates um, of people's kids at the conference when their their parents were in sessions or during the sessions. And I really enjoyed shooting that kind of candid work. And then I got interested in other aspects of photography, like video, augmented reality, which I'm still very interested in, um, and street photography, and really got hooked on the idea of just capturing these little flakes of people's lives on the street. Um, and that's what I've been doing mostly now. And I take it um, really seriously. Like I try to treat it like uh, exercise every day or almost every day. I try to go out and shoot uh, on the street and really try to discipline myself to, to observe and watch and shoot. And uh, I really uh, appreciate having that opportunity, being a retired, semi-retired guy, to be able to do that. And I and sort of my hunting ground is James Street North in Hamilton yes. and downtown Hamilton. Um, and I just love that space because it's just a constantly changing tableau of little experiences. And I just really love doing that kind of work. And, and then I also really like working on the images. Like I really work the images, especially black and white ones. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from looking at the contact sheets and, and notes of Ansel Adams, for example, and Eisenstadt and all these early black and white photographers and seeing and W W D Smith particularly all the, the oh, work yeah. they did on dodging and burning, you know, like the, if you look at the Minamata series or the, the country doctor series by Eugene Smith, you can see the care he took in doing the dodging and burning and really bringing the story to life and, and capturing expressions and just hiding the stuff that is extraneous to the story. And I just love doing that kind of work. So I think, my favorite thing is is coming back from a shoot and actually working on the images and 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 turning them into something as, as opposed to not just taking a picture but also making a picture right you said uh hunting ground right so that's um you know that's indicative of your style of shooting i guess or, or your your mindset your approach to it if you go out to, just mm -hmm. to see what's out there what 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 magic awaits you uh to capture yeah. rather than going with an image in mind and then going to get that image right or is or is yeah. that what you do do you could you have a kind of like a something in mind where you go out to look for it or is it just whatever appears appears whatever appears appears and and sometimes you know as a lot of street photography do of course you can see a picture coming and i think that's one of the skills that a, a, a good street photographer hones over time is saying if that guy moves here and I stand here and that change, light changes a little bit there. That's going to be a great shot, right? So you set yourself ready for it and you see it coming. Or you see somebody coming down the street and you look beside you and you see what's there. And you think if that person actually comes through here, that's going to be great. Or if she does this or, you know, he steps off the curb that way. So you're hoping that there's going to be a photography that, that uh, fo a photograph that develops in front of you. Um, and you got to be ready for it. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed in the last, uh, I don't know, maybe three months is I've switched over to shooting almost all my street stuff, either with my iPhone, but mostly with a, uh, a Ricoh GR 3X. Um, and that's so great because you've got the, the snap focus capability. So that you've got that sort of instant image that you shoot. You also got the really beautiful, sharp, sharp lens on that camera like i just love it and it's so small and you know just sort of inobtrusive and you, you can mm -hmm. shoot everything with you know on the one hand you know you, everything's organized on the right hand side so it's just like a perfect street camera and i i sort of view it sort of like you know you could you know you could fill out a pickerel with a bread knife but you wouldn't do a very good job and so mm -hmm. the, the the rico is like a finely honed fish knife for street photography like it's the perfect fit tool for that job you know and i still sit, shoot with my, my sony but uh more for portraiture and, and other kinds of stuff but for street stuff it's just such a great camera to use right and way less costly than a leica maybe <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah i mean, I mean yeah. Pullman and other people you've had on the show are leica boys and i, I always <laughs> of 
of what they they are putting on glass. You know, I just love the, the monochrome look. It's fabulous. And and someday, someday, maybe. But you know, I really I just love the size of this thing. And, and you know, I, I also looked at the Fuji as well. But I really thought this was for me right now. This is the camera that I just have sort of fallen in love with. Yeah, I've I've seen it uh, recommended on a couple of the different YouTube photography gear channels and, and street photography channels, and uh, it definitely has piqued my interest. Right, so uh, maybe one day I'll even be a Ricoh GR3 uh, user. <laughs> yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Prairie View Photo Tours. Prairie View Photo Tours invites photographers of all levels to book their all-inclusive, authentic Alberta adventure at pvphototours.com. You um you talked about back earlier in the day when you got onto Hamilton Magazine learning about the different printing and the color overlays and acetate sheets and stuff. A, a lot of the photographers I've spoken to on the podcast have have like their own dark rooms. They develop film, but they haven't had that aspect of printing experience. How is that? How did that kind of shape how you view, uh, well, view photography or view uh, printing your work? I, it really, you know, when you see a magazine or, or even like a, a T-shirt being silk screened with the layers of color coming in, it really helps you separate the colors and sort of see what is the, the yellow in colors that aren't yellow or the blue that aren't blue. Because when you come into a, a photograph in Lightroom, if you're shooting in color and developing in color, it's really super helpful to have a real appreciation of the color values that go into an image because then you can pull, you know, the yellows towards orange and the blues or the purples towards blues and have that wonderful contrasting color look, you know, very cinematic sort of color, complementary colors. Um, so I find it super valuable to be able to dissect color and see what makes up the color. Um, because then you, it, it really allows you to do color grading in a way that would be difficult if you didn't actually have an appreciation for what, you know, the, the primary colors that go into the palette that you're, you're working with. So I, I find it super valuable um, that way. And it was also just such an education in terms of what things look like printed as opposed to what mm. things look like as a transparency and the, the, the difference between a print and a magazine and a transparency and all of those things you have to learn because otherwise if you shoot um, and not for, shoot for print or not shoot for a magazine, you're going to get an effect that you didn't count on. So mm. it's all of that stuff I found, you know, and, and working in a dark room and, and actually you know, smelling like hypo and all, you know, all of that stuff, you know, that, that you just, you know, if you haven't had that experience as a young photographer, it, I think it would be really valuable to, to get, get it because, you know, like, even if you think about in, in Lightroom, the, the dodging and burning tools are that little thing on a stick and the, the hand. Well, if you've never worked in a dark room, you know, why, what are those things? What are those little icons? Well, you don't know unless you've actually will work with those things and, and dodged with a little stick and with the disc and, you know, burned in with your hand, right? Like that, all of that stuff just makes you a, a better photographer and a deeper photographer, I think. Right? Amazing. Uh, and uh, speaking of kind of appreciating uh, a technology of a certain time <laughs> to get that image, how, where do you think that you mentioned you have an interest in augmented reality. So where do you think uh, photography or digital art, like where do you think, kind of our future is going to shift when it comes to that, because I can see obviously Apple's come in with the beautiful disruptor and uh, it's going to kind of, I have a friend that's into that whole uh, augmented reality and metaverse, right? And that it's going to, it's going to kind of take us now away from being so focused on games and the games market into kind of something else. So where do you think photography has a role to play here? Well, I think, you know, it could be, I think it's really too early to tell. I mean, one of the really interesting things for me in seeing the coverage of the the Apple Vision One, the new headset, the augmented reality headset that Apple brought out a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, um, is that the thing that people thought was the killer app was the 3D movies. There's a, I guess, in the the demo that I guess about maybe 500 people have seen. There's a part where there's kids blowing out candles at a birthday party. And 
it was shot in 3D with the AR helmet. And in the Apple keynote, it looks kind of dorky. This guy with the ski mask on and his kid's birthday party kind of looks nerdy. But the the output of it apparently is breathtaking. That you could get up out, out of your seat in the demo room and sort of walk around the image. And it actually had depth to it. And people just said, whoa, 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 that is uh, mind-blowing, right? And so uh, that surprised me that that people would have that reaction because when I saw it in the demo, it didn't really strike me that much. I thought it could look a little cheesy, um, but they were really, really impressed with it. So, I, And I've been shooting um, stuff in use of photogrammetry to shoot AR stuff and also the, the newer sort of Nerf technology. Um, that allows you to do that almost bullet time kind of views of, of things. Um, and I'm really impressed with that. And I think that um, if the headset from Apple takes off and, and other players come into the space in uh, uh, the same kind of way that Apple does, which is really rich, you know, high resolution, uh, great depth of field, great, um, uh, you know, resol not resolution, but just sort of depth of color. Um, you're going to really see um, people being able to take three-dimensional objects and move them in front of themselves and look at them and expand them and stuff and real objects. So I, I spent some time a couple of years ago with the Hamilton Public Library and did a lot of experiments with augmented reality with some of their artifacts and some of the statues in town. Um, and it's really compelling, uh, even on the phone, just on the phone itself. But I think if, you, if we come to a time and I don't know, five years time when the AR glasses that are sort of the end game for Apple come about. I think those those kind of experiences could be really compelling. Now, are they going to be a replacement for black and white street photography or fashion photography or other kinds of photography? Uh, probably not. I don't think it's often the case that a new technology completely supplants the previous technology. But I think in some spaces, it could be extremely interesting. You know, certain like, you know, product photography, car photography, uh, fashion photography, um, I think could be pretty an amazing experience. But we're going to have to wait and see because a lot of the technologies that are going to be required for that to become compelling haven't been invented yet. And in some ways, um, I think the Apple Vision 1 is or the Pro is sort of a, a, a concept car. Um, for Apple and that their end games, I think certainly from what I've heard, you know, Tim Cook's end game is the glasses, not the, the ski goggles, right? Right. Yeah, there's another, uh, even in sports photography, they've started, uh, I remember Jordan Poland did a bit on this on YouTube about how they've had kind of basically uh, robotic <coughs> photographers essentially that follow the game. Uh, they're doing it during yeah. the World Cup. And then uh, I saw on Instagram, uh, there's this ad that keeps popping by about, you know, that mom and pop soccer league. You can go get this little kit in this little canvas bag and it pops out and it sits on a, like a tripod and it just records uh, the game. So it's basically, you know, yeah. a autonomous yeah. uh, photographer, videographer for your soccer game. It's crazy. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think we're going to see, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, Apple has done deals with Major League Soccer, and Major League Baseball. Um, so they're going to be able to, you know, put a 3D camera behind home plate or, you know, other places in the stadium and make it very possible for people to have an extremely immersive experience uh, with with sports. And, you know, that's why Apple has been investing in, in spatial audio, um, all of that, those technologies that are going to make it very possible to have a very, very visceral experience of sport. And I think that a lot and concerts. Um, and with Apple Music. So I think that there is going to be a really compelling um, opportunity for Apple. You know, and people have said, you know, if, if you have, if you pay $3,000 for a Taylor Swift ticket um, and you could pay, you know, $100 for an immersive experience of a Taylor Swift conference or even more, $500 or whatever pay per view, um, uh, there's be a lot of people who would sign up for that for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Exciting times, exciting times ahead. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. And, you know, I love just, I just love watching this stuff go down and, and when I have an opportunity to participate in it, I, I certainly try to, right? Amazing. Well, uh, what is also an immersive experience is uh, your stream photography. So uh, I'm going to get into it if you don't mind. Sure. 
All right, we're going to start with this guy right here. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I, I really like about doing street photography um, is people's expressions. And one of the really fascinating things uh, when you're dealing with folks who, and this is a, a gentleman named in Keith, who has some, uh, you know, challenges with his mental health. And, you know, you see this in folks like this, that they're completely guileless in terms of their expression. Like this, this is not an expression that if you said to most people, I'd like, I'd love to take your picture, you know, Keith, would you mind? Uh, this would not be the face they would make. Um, but this is him expressing his honest self in a way that most people don't. Most people put on, literally put on a mask when you ask to take their picture. Right. And this is, you know, this is Keith without any mask. This is him. This is who he is. Um, and he was, you know, a very gentle guy and a very nice guy. Um, and I just, so I just love this picture because, you know, his eyes and his whole expression is just who he was and he didn't change. Um, he didn't slip on the mask. And, and I just love that about these kinds of uh, uh, photography, this kind of photography. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, your images are striking, but you do capture that authenticity. And maybe, again, maybe that's uh, because of your, your subject, right? Like you just said, they don't put up that, that persona for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now this is a woman named Mary. And I've photographed Mary uh, probably six, six, seven times over the past few years. I first met her. I did a, a, a photo essay uh, for CBC Hamilton on Barton Street, which is a, a stretch of, of the north end of Hamilton that is this particular stretch um, was in this right on the knife edge of gentrification. Um, and it's still eatering. I'm not sure which way it's going to go. Um, but she was at that time, she was in an encampment in uh, I think it was Woodland Park encampment. Uh, this is a picture taken um, by the YWCA encampment that you've talked about before. Um, and she, she's just a, a lovely woman. Uh, she's always very, uh, again, very gentle, very polite, uh, and really quite likes having her picture taken. Uh, and I just find it really sad because she's, I, I'm really glad that she's still alive, but she's just always in on the edge of encampment, uh, always homeless and just having a, a very hard time with, uh, I think she has some drug issues. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, but I just love taking her picture because she's, she remembers me. She's happy to see me. She's happy to have her picture taken. Um, and this was a moment uh, when the, the encampment was sort of in full bloom. It's now been um, mostly uh, removed. Uh, what you see behind her is, is gone now. But back then there was, I don't know, like 30 tents in, in the encampment. And she was, was there that day when I, I came down and, and came by. Well, so, all, yeah, all that stuff that uh, I was speaking about before, like all of that's gone now. Yeah, yeah, almost all of it. There's still around the back corner there. You can't see that there's still tents there. I was there today, um, but most of it's gone. Yeah. Right. This, 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 I love this picture because... This guy, I was in an alley that was off of um, John Street in Hamilton, and it's a really uh, bad alley in terms of graffiti and junk and everything. And and oh, it's you know great great old buildings in Hamilton, but the alleyways are not necessarily the greatest in the world. Mm -hmm. And what I love about this is that I was he was originally I don't know maybe fifty feet away from me, and I started taking his picture, and he saw me taking his picture, and he was coming towards me. And so as he came towards me, he pulled the camera out and was taking it. And so then I said, hey, can I take some more pictures of you? And he said, yeah. And he was holding up the phone and he was saying, I've taken your picture too, pal. Right? So I just <laughs> looked on it, right? Like it was pretty funny. <laughs> he was having a good time. So it's I just like capturing that, right? Do you ever have any situations where it becomes kind of a heated issue that you took somebody's picture unaware, you know, with them not being unaware, them being unaware of it? Uh, you know, I generally not a few times I've had people get mad at me. Um, and when that happens, I've, uh, you know, deleted the picture if they want me to. Um, and I had an incident, you know, I was saying to my wife that I've, you know, I broke my rule a, a couple of, uh, a few days ago. 
where I don't take pictures of kids on the street um, mm -hmm. because it's just, you're just asking for it, right? And there were these three kids that came out of a cafe just as we were, it was a uh, an art crawl in Hamilton. And uh, these three kids came out and I just sort of reflexively took a shot because I just, I, you know, I wasn't really even thinking. I, it, you know, I just sort of reflexively did it. And bang. One of the dads came over and said, hey, you know, I decided to take a picture of those kids. And I said, yeah, I did. I, you know, I take uh, street photography. And he said, well, I, you know, I'm a parent of one of them and or a couple of them. And uh, and I said, OK, well, I'm happy if you're not happy. I'm happy to delete the picture. And I showed him and, and deleted the picture. And uh, that's that's the area that if if you're a street photographer, that's going to get you in trouble. And like I felt really stupid that I reflexively took that picture, you know, because I, I generally don't because I know it's just 10 miles of bad highway. Um, but most of the time, uh, people are, are really good about it. And there was actually had a funny incident about three weeks ago where I had my GR in my hand and I went by a couple of girls and I had it sort of up near my face. Um, and the, uh, I went by them and then the girl turned around and came back to me and said, I saw you take my picture. It's okay. It's cool, man. It's okay. You took my picture. It's, and I said, actually, no, I didn't take your picture. <laughs> Right. So I, you know, I've been, you know, bugged by people who, whose picture I didn't take, but most people are, are, you know, I like taking candid stuff because that's when people are real. And, mm -hmm. and probably most of the time people aren't aware that I've taken their picture. Uh, when they are, they're cool about it. And, and, you know, often I will say to somebody, could I take your picture? Like in the case mm -hmm. of, of Keith, um, and, and people are really generally really good about it. I, really haven't any kind of really serious altercation at all right nice nice this is uh brianna uh, and she was in the encampment the same encampment i mentioned that uh, mary was at the woodland park on barton street in hamilton and uh i really like this picture because um, she was just, um, she as a, a street walker and she was out, she, this is early morning and she was just getting ready to hit the street, unfortunately. Um, and she was quite open to having her picture taken. And this is, uh, this is one of those pictures where, um, I really wanted it to be an environmental portrait. This was mm -hmm. shot with my Sony, this was before I had the GR. And this is a picture, a good example of I had to do a lot of work in light to you know, get her face the way I wanted to hold back some of the background, especially the the trees on the other side of the uh, the tarpaulin there and stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to, you know, it just it's one of those images, you know, that you, you just really got to work it to to make it what you imagine it it could be, the best it could be. Um, and she was, and I took her a print uh, of the picture and the next day, and she was quite happy with it. Um, so that's good. I, you know, I think, and I think a lot of folks, um, that are, uh, in, in a situation like Brianna or, or Mary actually quite like having their picture taken because I think for a couple of reasons, because somebody's paying attention to them and, and talking to them and stuff. And it's, and it's a trans, it's a human transaction. That's not about pity and it's not about money. Like it's, here's, here's a loony, you know, uh, Godspeed. And it's not yeah. people just feeling sorry for you. It's, it's a more of a, a deeper transaction. And I think that that's really a, a different kind of transaction for folks like that. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, really, she really was uh, appreciative of the, the photograph. And I often, um, on, when I go down, she was north, if I shoot like at, I, there's a biker cafe that I, I shoot a lot of pictures at. And I'll often, I've, I guess six times now, I've taken prints down to black and white prints down to the owner to give to people that I've taken pictures of at the cafe and they, people just, you know, I, and I think it may be a millennial thing, but holy <laughs> hell, people love prints, right? Yeah. Because they don't see them. Like what, what the hell is that? Right. Like where did that come from? Um, and so it's really great because I built up a rapport with the guy at the, the cafe and there's a couple of other, well, you, you'll see a shot coming up. I think that you're, you're going to show, um, where it's just been great because now if I I'm around there or shooting there, people say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 is great. You know, and so it's really fun. Yeah. So this is, that's the biker cafe. And I love this, I love this shot because 
It, it really honestly is. It's, it's a coffee shop that, that focuses on bike gear and they have a thing every thir second Thursday night where like they get all like, you know, the owner said they've had like in the course of an evening, 300 bikes show up. So it's like oh, wow. Port Dover and Hamilton. <laughs> um, and, and so, and this day there was, I don't know, maybe a dozen bikes out front, like really beautiful Harleys and stuff. And here's this guy with this kind of Wolverine sideburn wearing a Star Trek pa short pajamas and playing a, a, a Nintendo Switch. And I just thought, oh, man, you have balls, boy. But that was, <laughs> it was just really, I just, I just, I just love this. So I saw this from across the road. I was coming back from, from further north on the street. And I just, and as soon as I saw this, I said, oh, I got to get, I just love this, right? So. And it wasn't until I got really close that I realized those are Star Trek pajamas. But, um, but what I love about the light here is that the light is, especially in the afternoon, bounces off a wall across the street and then really gives it wonderful bright light on the, uh, the bar or, or the area in the window. And then the background, it falls away. So again, it's another print where, or another image where you have to do a lot of Lightroom work to isolate the background and pull up some of the faces like the barista face I had to pull up a little bit and dark and on the left hand side there. Yeah. But you know, I love, I just love doing that kind of work in Lightroom, particularly now with the ability to isolate uh, facial uh, color or facial tone and body skin and background and all the gradients you can do. It's, it's just a pleasure to work with. Right? Amazing. Love it. <laughs> and and uh, I just, uh, we were talking about playing the Nintendo Switch. I was taking a look at his bag to the left. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's just and i like i like photographs like this it's sort of um uh sort of try i try to do more kind of joel meyerwitz kind of stuff the sort of street opera kind of photography mm -hmm. where there's other things happening you know there's yeah. interactions in behind him and stuff and i really enjoy and there's another image that you can look at that that is in that, that zone i just i, I really love it of those moments that I can capture. Right? Amazing. That's great. Who are, uh, let me just pull this down for a second. Where is it? Where are we? Um, who are some of your kind of bigger influences? You mentioned Joel Meyerowitz, but what, what's kind of the, who, who do you like to, whose work do you like to look at? Uh, I, Robert Kappa or Frank Kappa, uh, you know, Dorothea Lang, Margaret Burke White, W. Eugene Smith, certainly Brasson. Mm. Um, all of those, those folks who were really, really great at they were great craftspeople, right? Like not only were they they good human beings, uh, certainly a case of, of Eugene Smith and Dorothy Lang, but uh, you know they just were they really cared about the craft, um, and I that's something I really appreciate. Like I I really have a hard time looking at bad black and white prints or bad black and white images that somebody hasn't taken the care to to do the exposure properly or, or capture the, you know, the full dynamic range of an image and, and have all that to work with and, and, and bring it to life. So that's what I really admire, not only the, the stuff that you capture, you know, the sort of decisive moment of Brisson, but also the, you know, just the wonderful sense of texture and mm. depth and shade and light that you see in a work like uh, of Ansel Adams or, or Eugene Smith or, or, you know, uh, Diane Arbus is another, you know, I, I just sort of, there was a period of time where I just couldn't get enough Diane Arbus. Like, I just love seeing her work with, you know, the sort of marginal folks in society. And that's one of the, I think that's really influenced to what I assume is that, that kind of, of street stuff. And again, just a wonderful technician, right? And, and I, you know, I don't consider myself any kind of artist. I'm just, you know, a schmo from Hamilton trying to take better pictures. But I try to be a craftsman, right? Mm. I try to really hone my skills and crafts so that I can do the very best by an image in the end. That I, the image that I make is the very best image I can make. And that, that really matters. I don't care if anybody calls me an artist, but I would not like it if somebody did call me a craftsman, right? That's an interesting distinction. And uh, yeah, I like that. I'm going to have to mo uh, meditate on that one. That's a really good distinction. <laughs> Uh, I also like uh, W. Eugene Smith. Like, um, I'm a big jazz nerd, so 
his jazz kind of the jazz studio, I guess, their apartment that he ran with all those photos are just like super fascinating to me. So I love it. I love his work as well. Yeah. I love the details yeah, here. It's is, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This, so this is, again, this was saw with my Sony, I think. Um, yeah, this is uh, a neighbor of mine called Dimitri, and you've talked about him in a previous podcast. Um, and he's a guy that's been living on the street since 2016, I think. Uh, sad, you know, very sad story. He's a Russian immigrant. Uh, his dad committed suicide in Minsk when he was, he and his mom were living here in Hamilton. And that was during a time that, uh, Dimitri was in high school. Uh, and I think that had a, a serious impact on his mental health. Um, and he's been living at the end of my street, Ray street here in Hamilton, uh, for a number of years. I, and we actually got to know one another because I was walking down that way with my camera. And he said, oh, come, come, take my pizza, take my pizza. I said, oh, sure. So I took some shots of him and I got to know him a little bit. Actually, I, I, I wanted to do a, a story about him for the Alan Spectator because I said my, my background is journalism. Um, and I did a, a long audio interview with him. And that, that's how I learned a lot about his story. And I, I managed to track down his mother and a picture of him in his yearbook in high school and all that stuff. Um, so he's a very, very interesting character. Uh, he's now, he was, and he's, he's like, um, a, a junk God, like all the junk in the neighborhood comes to him, right? Like he's, you can take away all his junk and five, you know, five hours later, he'll just be surrounded by junk. Um, and so he's been moved out of where he was. He's now just on the other side of the road. Very, you know, sad, you know, it's a very sad story. You know, he's he drinks a lot of uh, yellow Listerine, which has a high denatured alcohol content. So he's sort of killing himself from the inside out. But he's quite a nice guy, actually, and and sort of sometimes quite funny guy. Um, but this, these are his hands, and you can see that he, uh, you know, they're a bit swollen up. He's they've been more swollen than that. But you can just see the the toll that his life has taken on his hands. And I, I really like this photograph because it tells you a lot about him without actually showing him. Mm -hmm. um, and so and I and he really likes rings and, and he he's a magpie. Like he loves <laughs> bright, shiny objects, right? And one of the funniest things that, that happened, like if you if you take him anything, like his his diet is uh, potato chips and starburst candies. So if you take him like a Starburst candies or anything, he'll want to trade you something. And one day he said, oh, I have something for you. I have something for you. And so he held on his hand with this shiny foil thing in his hand. He said, you'll take, you'll take. And I looked over and it's a package of suppositories. I said, you know, <laughs> thanks a lot to me. Um, so, you know, he, so I, re I really hope he, he finds some help. Uh, he's, you know, he's sort of one of these real, um, fringe cases where he really won't take any help. He won't go indoors. He won't be around people. He's smart enough to know the answers to all the questions that healthcare workers ask. So he's just out there and, he, and he's just going to stay out there. And unfortunately, he's, I think he's going to die young out there. But uh, mm -hmm. he's a, a very interesting character. Right. So this is a guy that. Uh, man, this was hard. Uh, I met him in the same alley that, that I took the other shot of with, uh, um, just off of John street. And, uh, I, he, he was, I can't remember how he got that. Uh, he, I know he was beat up somehow. He got into a fight. Somehow. He was in a wheelchair when I met him and it was so hard to talk to him because he was addicted to painkillers and. He just said that that scar tissue, he said that that's just a bundle of nerves, man. That's just, just raw nerves. Like, see, see, this is in constant pain. Um, but, you know, quite willing to have his, his photograph taken um, and quite willing to talk to me. And this was part of a, uh, and I was shooting a, a series. I did, a, I did a, a fundraising book for downtown shelters called Harsh Light. And this was one of the images I, I shot for that. And, um, it's, I just found it so interesting that he was completely willing to be photographed despite that terrible scar on his face. Um, and, you know, I just thought it was incredibly brave and, uh, it was very interesting to talk to him, but just, I just felt really, really sorry for the guy. 
and again, that was a hard picture to develop too, right? Because of the the light and shadow, which is tricky. Oh yeah. This this one, uh, this one is again. This is the encampment uh, just across from the YWCA on McNabb Street in Hamilton. This is one of my favorite pictures I've taken in a long time because it was uh, one of those incredible lucky moments where you know you've got this guy. Um, who's got a T-shirt that says that's that says when life gives you lemons, right? Oh, and he's sure. in the encampment, and there's that skull in the middle of the, the thing that was on. I, I guess it's an e-bike or a motorcycle. I can't remember which. Um, but I when I shot this, I thought, oh, this is so great! Like you know, I just love this shot. Uh, and obviously, I was looking at it in color. But one of the things that, you know, I've been trying to develop over the last several years or decades, really, is my ability to see in black and white um, yeah. and yeah. to sort of pre, pre-imagine, uh, pre-visualize a photograph. And, and that's something that Ansel Adams was really uh, keen on, and I think Stieglitz was as well, of this idea of pre-visualization, of saying, this is what you are looking at, but you've got to visualize. And they were Um, Ansel Adams, but to to see it in black and white and in, and see the tonal values and what you could do with the image. So this is one where again I just I I love taking the picture and I love making the picture of working on all of the aspects of the image so that your eye is drawn to that skull, your eye is drawn to that t-shirt, to the uh, downcast face, and then all the other details. Um, come into play as you sort of examine his scene and see exactly what life handed him, right? So I, I'm super happy with this image. I'm super sad that that kind of existence uh, is is in Hamilton, but uh, you know it was a real uh, opportunity to sort of depict that for people and and show people and 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 document what's happening. And that's one thing I've been trying to do um, is document uh, to show that this actually happening in the city and you know i think there there's a debate that that i've been caught in a little bit and i try to avoid engaging in of uh, the the issue of uh photographing the homeless uh of uh, you know it's a sort of pornography it's called or you know uh, and i really have trouble with uh that argument because i think that it's taken to the extent, the extreme that you can't take pictures of the homeless. You shouldn't take pictures of the homeless. Um, they can't give you consent. All of that stuff means that they would go undocumented, right? And right. and the reality is in, in Canada that if you're in a public place and somebody has a reasonable expectation, uh, doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, that you can photograph them. Um, and so, it, and if we don't photograph this kind of stuff, it will go undocumented. You know, because the end game, if you say you can't photograph the poor, it's pornography and stuff, then all of that part of the, the of life, of street life, is erased. It, does, it won't exist because nobody would photograph it, right? Um, and I think that would be a terrible, terrible waste because it's only through um, photography or some very strong photography that social change has happened. Uh, especially black and white photography. I'm thinking of the the young woman running down the street being napalmed in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, a good example, Tiananmen Square. You know, I mean, over and over again, you see uh, social change brought about by photography. Um, and so I think it's super important that we um, capture the harshest, uh, ugliest aspects of society because if we don't pay attention, if we don't document it, they'll be forgotten. And I think that would be a real, a real shame and a real disservice to the people who are living those lives, right? I absolutely agree with you. So this is a, an example of just, uh, I, there's um, a street in Hamilton called York Boulevard. This is near uh, Phil Pot Memorial Church. Uh, just down from where these people are is a common meeting place for folks. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a communal place for a lot of homeless folks also a, a place of, of drug exchange uh, among other things but that's one of the sad aspects of it there's it's also a, a good place for them to um there's community groups that provide coffee for them and food for them and stuff which is also very positive but i just came by one day and 
and just saw these three people there. And I just thought, uh, especially the guy on the left, like just abs abject misery. You know, they're just so at the end of the rope, right? And so uh, this is, a, it was a really hard photograph to take. It was a really hard scene to see. But I just thought, you know, I, someone's got to capture this and record that this is where we've put people. You know, it's not, uh, you know, it's very often not their fault, maybe never their faults. You know, it's it's a, a terrible case in Hamilton of, of high rents and not affordable housing and a drug crisis and COVID and all of these things have come together to create this terrible situation of, of you know, incredible homelessness. We've got 1,600 homeless people in Hamilton right now. Oh, wow. And these are th three of them, right? And just, you know, you just cannot feel anything but incredible pity looking at this photograph and just think, you know, how how can these people survive and how did we, we as a society put them in a position where this is their life, right? It's just, but you can't look away. Like, if you look away, then, then you're just ignoring this situation. And so... Um, I, I took this shot and, you know, none of their faces are shown, um, in, in this case, um, but their situation is shown. And again, a, 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 a photograph that I had to do a lot of work on to, to get what I pre-visualized, but I, I'm really happy with the, the final results of it. You said, uh, 1600, uh, homeless in Hamilton. Uh, I live in a town that is like just over 1,800 in its entirety. So that'd be right. the entire population of the place I live. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really terrible situation. And and I think the, the city is is trying, and it's a very difficult thing. I mean, it's just this this tragedy that's been brewing for decades, you know, that the, the you know, and it's really, you know, it's easy to blame the provincial government. It's easy to blame the federal government. It's easy to blame municipal government. It all, but it's all plays together and to just create this perfect storm of misery for so many people. You know, it's really sad. Yeah. So this is, uh, this, this was a really sad situation. This is a, a woman uh, named TJ, just like you. Um, oh. And uh, she, I, I met her a couple of times. This is when I was shooting the, the Harsh Light series. Um, and she was, this is at the corner of King and James in Hamilton. And this is the first time I met her. And she was wailing like this. She was wandering around. And King and James is a very, very busy street, particularly King Street. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a highway. Um, and so she was getting really near the street. And so I called 911 and said, you know, there's this woman in distress. And I stayed there for about half an hour where I, where I took this picture from because I didn't want her to wander out onto the street. And I tried to talk to her and she just, at, at this point, she was just beyond listening. I, I don't know what, you know, personal demon she was facing down here, but she just was in such a miserable state. And so... I, you know, I just felt it was really important to to capture that moment because to me it just it, it, it's and it's the cover of the harsh light book that I did that it's it just so encapsulated that personal agony and and demons that that she is dealing with now the the next day I went down downtown and I met her again and she was a completely different person right? Whatever was in her system was out of her system. She was very pleasant. Um, I took a photograph of her and she looked really nice. You know, she had a very pleasant face um, and she was smiling. Um, and then I took her that print the, the next day and she was very, very happy with it. Um, so I, but then I've seen her since then and she's been in, in this kind of state again. So it's just so, so sad to see. But, uh, you know, I, again, I think a lot of people would not have taken this photograph um, and would have felt that it was an intrusion. And it, it, they may be right. They, they might argue with me, and I'm sure there would be people who are pissed off that I took the photograph. But it's got to be documented. This, this, this is real. This is happening. And um, it's still happening in the same location that, you know, there's a, a homeless woman just down, just down from here. I was there a few hours ago. Um, so it's, you know, things haven't changed dramatically. In fact, they, they've gotten worse since I took this photograph, unfortunately. This, 
<laughs> I just, I, I just love. I just trying to take a turn bit. to more positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I just love this picture because this is one of those moments where, like, I've been. If you look at my glass feed, you'll notice that I've taken a number of photographs around this corner, which is I uh, somebody has gotten these old photographs and blown them up and 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 sort of billboarded them through the wall here. And there's other ones of you know, sort of women that are you know, sort of flapper women and stuff. It's a really fun little exhibition that somebody's put together. Um, so I've shot a number of pictures here. This was a really rainy day last week, I think early last week. Um, and I saw this woman walking, you know, uh, down the street towards this. And I saw the purple and then, you know, and you got the complimentary orangey, you know, okra sound of tones on the wall. Said, oh man, if she comes by here, this is going to be great. And I, I wanted to shoot this with the GR, but it was just really raining hard. So I said, this was an iPhone shot. Um, and so, and I was lucky because with the iPhone, you don't, you're not with the GR, with the snap focus, you've got the, the exact moment you want with the iPhone, you're, you've got a bit of a delay. So I'm really lucky with the way the, the handcuffs are swinging and the foot is coming down in the rain and, and everything. So it was, a, it was a, a lucky shot, but man, I just love this picture. Um, and you know, so it was just, these are, these are the kind of moments you live for, right? Like you just, yeah, think, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe I got that moment. Like, you know, I was, you know, uh, you know, the, the old expression of fortune prepare, you know, uh, prefers the prepared mind, you know, that I was ready for it and I saw it coming, but I, it could have been, you know, a half second earlier or a half second later. It's that decisive moment, right? Like I just, it was pure luck. I got the picture I wanted, right? Like. I, I knew this is what I wanted and I just sort of really luckily got it. I could have easily missed it. Like that umbrella, that umbrella had just been touching the edge of the wall or if that foot had been down or if the, the swing of the handcuffs had moved it behind her leg, it wouldn't be the same picture at all. It was just a dead lucky shot. You know, just a, a thought just occurred to me that uh, going out as a practice specifically with your cell phone will actually help you become a better uh, photographer in terms of finding that decisive moment because on my DSLR I can pray and spray or spray or spray and pray or however it's termed right I can hold yeah. it down at 30 frames a second or whatever and yeah. I can find the moment in that stream of shots with your cell phone like with my my old potato that I shoot with sometimes it's like I push it and then there's like a half a second to a full second delay before the yeah. shutter even goes so you, you really have to know what you're looking for when you do with your phone yeah, and you know, I mean, I think you know, I'm shooting with an iPhone 14 Pro, so I mean, I've been shooting raw, so it's a 48 megapixel image. So you know, it's there's, you know, there's tons of information there to work with, and I I, I really like using the smartphone. Uh, I prefer the GR, uh, and I really like the get close, you know, and I think uh, was it Daniel Eggy the the uh, person that's the communications person or the marketing person for um uh glass was it was saying you know that you've got to get close right and that's a real frank cap of you you know if your photographs aren't good enough you're not close enough right so and i've seen some young photographers in hamilton shooting street stuff with a telephoto and i've you know i've chatted with them and said you know you need to get you need to get closer your, your photographs aren't going to be as good if you're shooting with a telephoto you know you've got to have the, the uh, courage and confidence to get up close, right? Yeah, absolutely. Such a different feel, I think, between, you know, a same composition, but, you know, shot with a 70 to 200 versus like a 24 to 70. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Or, 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 or your 628. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, like, I like the 40 millimeter, you know, the GR comes in the 28 millimeter and 40 millimeter versions. And I, act, I like the 40 meter, 48 millimeter, or sorry, 40 meter, 40 millimeter version. You know, one, because it complements my iPhone. Uh, and two, because I just like that, uh, that aspect ratio that you get with the, uh, um, the 40 millimeter. I, mm -hmm. I just really nice for street work for me anyway. So this was a photograph I just took a, a couple of days ago. Um, it's graduation time here in Hamilton. Uh, McMaster University is a university in town. 
And so there's lots of uh, people who are graduating, lots of international students. And uh, you know, I, I suspect that their parents fly in from their home countries. And I think this was a case where this is Jackson Square. Um, it has a hotel attached to it. So these, uh, this is a young girl who I think is graduating uh, and her parents just coming out of Jackson Square. And again, it was just one of these moments where you just turn and the picture is right in front of you. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't see them coming out of the doors there. I just happened, I, I think we've got another image that I'll talk about in a minute, but, um, I was taking another picture and then I turned and I saw this young woman walking towards me and, and just grabbed this and I super happy with it. Um, and again, another image that you have to make, you know, I, I did a lot of work on that image in terms of, uh, the tonalities of the background. But I just love this. Uh, and as, as a, a person that, that looked at the picture said, you know, if it hadn't been for the cell phone, this could have been taken, you know, in a different decade, right? With the clothes and mm -hmm. stuff, you know, like it's just um, the sort of pantaloon top is really quite striking. And, and it was re I'm really happy that she was wearing white like that because it's just it really made her stand out. So, yeah, I'm really happy with this picture. And I was just super lucky. Like I just saw it and shot it and, and it just worked out. Right. So this is a, this is the picture <laughs> that I took, and you know I you know God love them. Like I, I have such such empathy and sympathy for folks on the street, but you know I was walking along Market Street in Hamilton, which is the street that, that intersects with um, Bay Street, which is downtown. And I saw this and, you know, I, and I, I mentioned on glass, you know, I've seen a lot of interesting things on my photo walks and this, like, I, I'm honest to God, TJ, my reaction to it was, oh, come on, really, <laughs> really, <laughs> what are you doing? Right. And, you know, what, and, and he was, he's not dead or anything, he's just snoozing. You know? So uh, there's a lot of humor value, you know, and Hamilton, mm -hmm. and you have to look at it, oh, come on, like, this is so Hamilton. But, you know, it was obviously also sadness to it as well. And you know, it's really unfortunate that that young woman and her parents are in another five seconds going to walk by that guy, right? So yeah. not really, a, you know, not really the greatest impression of Hamilton for somebody from another country. But, you know, and I don't blame this guy by any stretch, but I just... You know, and I've I've shared this image with a couple of my friends who are also lifelong Hamiltonians, and and their <laughs> response back was, "Really, really, oh man." So you know, and he he was fine. I don't know why he comes to have a, a nap there, but I, but it's just I really like the the uh, vertical lines uh, that almost look like he's being suspended there with the the pipes. <laughs> um, so it's just, and all of the words in different countries, you know, that's a, a, a it's called Nations. It's a, a, a store that has a variety of foods from all over the world. Um, so that, I just like how it all came together. Um, so I really, uh, those are, those are the kinds of moments and images and experiences that I, I find just so fascinating. So, you know, you just step back from that whole little tableau. So I'm walking down the street. I see this guy, I take this picture, as I'm taking this picture, unbeknownst to me, that young woman is coming out of Jackson Square, walking towards me, and I turn and take that picture, right? And you just think, man, that's, that's why you do this, right? This is why street photography is so fascinating, because I can do that walk every single day, and every single day I'm going to get different images of different people, doing different things, sometimes sad, sometimes funny, sometimes like, oh my God, I don't believe this. And that's just the, to me, that's just the joy of street photography, of capturing these little flakes of life that, um, you know, that you, you see. And really, I think it was Dorothea Lang who said that, you know, a camera is a, a device that lets you, you see without a camera, right? That it teaches you to pay attention right? To be intentional, to observe. And, you know, I'm by nature introverted. Um, and so I am an observer, uh, more than engage, uh, in social situations, certainly. Um, and so this is a fantastic way of observation and, and 
sort of bearing witness to say, even you know, and this we, we were talking about this before with the street photography of, of homeless people, that someone has to bear witness. Someone has to say, I was here. This is what I saw. Right. And to do that without uh, putting filters on it, without sugarcoating it, without uh, being afraid to show what's really happening. And if you don't do that, then your photographs suffer. And I think society suffers without those photographs, right? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So this, I really love this picture for a, a number of reasons. Um, because this was one of the first photographs I took with the iPhone 14 Pro uh, with the 48 megapixel capability. Um, and more importantly, this is one of my dearest friends, uh, Wilson Southam, who uh, was one of the Southams in the Southam newspaper chain. Um, and he is just a remarkable, remarkable guy who's had just a, an astonishing life. He's a brilliant guy. You know, he was like a downhill ski instructor. He, you know, rode his motorcycle through South America, you, you know, in the really bad times. You know, he was captain of, a, you know, the Oxford Debating Society, like just on and on and on, like just ridiculous, uh, wonderful life that he, he shared. And he's one of my great mentors. And he lives in a, uh, a ranch style home on Lakeshore, you know, like multi million dollar home on Lakeshore in Burlington, Ontario. And these days lives in his garage. Like he's a, a really interesting character that we, 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 or that we, 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 he, surround, <laughs> he, he sur surrounds himself with, uh, crossword puzzles and the economist and books. And he just sits in there and smokes cigars all day and, and reads and does crossword puzzles. And, you know, uh, you know, he's 90 years old now and we, we still visit, uh, fairly regularly when, you know, um, and call at, we talk probably every couple of days. Um, and he's a wonderful guy. And so I just love this picture because this is Wilson, you know, this is him doing his crossword puzzle, him smoking his cigar and me capturing it with a phone. Right. And so this goes back to, you know, what I was first talking about with the quick take 100 and, and even the Diana camera. You know, the technology has changed and I've been fortunate enough that in my 67 years now that I got to go along for that ride, right? And so, and Wilson was part of that journey and, and Wilson was one of the reasons I got to do the research and development when I had that quick take 100. And so to be able to take this photograph with a phone that, you know, and work, you know, be able to have enough dynamic range to be able to work on this image to to get this kind of image out of that phone shot is just to me it's just it's just a wonderful gift that you know i've been able to experience this ride to the point where this guy that's been so important to me could be captured with that that technology and and so i just i just love this photograph uh yeah. and and he does he does as well which i'm really pleased about yeah, despite all the the uh, crazy things happening in the world, we're also you know a part of the most exciting time I think to be alive, right? With all this stuff happening, we talked about the Apple One. Uh, you talk about going from like, you know, uh, cap sorry, the uh, quick quick capture now to your forty six megapixel yeah. phone shot, like absolutely crazy and exciting times. Because who knows next year and the year after, you know what's going to be happening, what's going to be available. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, I think it's super important to engage with technology like this. Like it's really, it would be really easy to to say, oh, you know, that's for kids or, you know, I, I don't have any use for that. And I just think, you know, folks that, that do that, you know, you're, you're, you've got a golden ticket to do remarkable things, to engage in social communities or take remarkable photographs or listen to spatial audio or learn about all that. All of the technologies that are evolving now that I just so revel in the rate of change. Like I just love experiencing change and trying to, to keep up with things and, and keep abreast of things and try to imagine what's coming. Um, I, I, it's just so valuable for me. And I just, you know, I think it would be, my life would be so much poorer for 
not paying attention to the technologies that allow us to be better storytellers and better witnesses and 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 hopefully better people, right? Mm. So this this is a photograph of a guy named Bruce, and I've photographed him two or three times now, um, and he's a a really nice guy. Uh, he he's one of these guys who um, I think made some poor choices early in life. He he said that he had been scouted by the the Buffalo Sabers when he was young, and said I screwed up. You know I screwed up. Uh, some, so I don't know what happened with Bruce. He's uh, from the Maritimes and, and really wants to go back there. He's staying at the Salvation Army right now. Uh, very nice guy. I see him on the, the street on James North. And he, this was just him in repose in the Hamilton Public Library. And I just, it was on the fourth floor, I think. And the elevator doors opened and there he was. And so I just had this, you know, it's, it, it, you know, I saw him at a bit of a distance and just walked towards him and, and took this shot. This is a GR shot. And I just really like this. And, and a lot of people on glass really like this shot. Um, uh, just because it, it's just such a, I, I think just a, it's a nice, gentle portrait of this guy that, that is very respectful. And just, I love the light on the side of his face and the fill light on the other side of his face and just everything about it, the cross around his neck. I, I just think it all comes together for me in a really sim very simple portrait, but just one that's one of one of my favorites for a while. Nice, like that. And this, I I love this because it this is the sort of Joel Meyerowitz street street offer kind of shot, right? Like this is a cafe. Called, it's a Portuguese cafe on James North called Ola, uh, which has been there for a long, long time, and. Fantastic cafe, fantastic Portuguese tarts and uh, food and stuff. It's really fun, the bacalao and everything. And I was just leaving, and th these women were taking an order from these women. And I just, I just, it's got a real uh, Arche Brisson feel to it. Not, not that I'm anywhere near his level, but I just it didn't mean the, the the sort of sensibility of the image, the the moment that's captured, um, and. I took them a print, and it's now behind where that woman yeah. is with the, the register behind her. And it's on the wall there. <laughs> nice. um, but she really loved it. Uh, and the owner of the cafe, uh, who isn't in the shot, uh, saw it and just just loved the shot. And you know, the the woman said, "Oh, you, you should have you know should have let us pose." And I said, "No, no, 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 no. Look at, you know, you're just, that's you." And the owner of the cafe said, "That's that's them. That's that's them." Right. And this is this is why, to me, candid photography and street photography is so important, because most people who get their picture taken, like I was saying, are wearing a mask or they're posing and they're not them. They're they're a projection of themselves or an image or a simulacrum of themselves. They're not the real person. Um, but these are them. That's how they behave behind the counter. That's how they interact with customers. That's them real. And I just love capturing real people. And, and this is, you know, I, I really enjoyed this. And I really like this too, because it's an early GR shot. And I, I just thought this is a, a kind of image that I wouldn't have been able to capture eas as easily with my Sony or even my yeah, Apple. It yeah. was so, so quick, right? Like I had the camera up to my face and back down beside my, within seconds. Like it was just, here's this moment. I can see her leaning forward. I can see her about to engage and bang, right? You've got the image. And that's, I just love that kind of stuff. Right? <laughs> awesome. That's great. So this is a, uh, a shot. This, I think this was with my Sony. Um, this was a reflection. This was, I, I think, you know, on, on the last, there, there was a big deal about reflections for a while. Mm. I think there was, I can't remember the guy's name. He was really pushing to make it a, a category. And I think it is now in, in uh, the glass that you can have photographs of reflection. This was uh, just, uh, I really like this shot because this is a, a coffee shop called St. James and their window has this sort of embossed glass uh, skull on it that really reflects light in a really interesting way. And so I was just super happy with the, the time of day that it just worked out that the 
the um, car across the road is reflected in it and the light's just hitting this. So I just really liked this from a, a tonality point of view that I really love the dynamic range here of everything from the, the whites in the hub of the car to the dark of the, you know, the, uh, the other, the tree shadows and stuff. So this is the kind of black and white image I love because it really celebrates the true tonality of black and white. And mm. I think that that's one of the things that I really value uh, in black and white photography is pulling out the depth of an image and the the detail of an image by paying attention to making sure your, your blacks are open a bit, that your whites aren't blown out. And just, again, just sort of, the, I like this shot because of the craft of it. It's a kind of shot that if you didn't know what you were doing, you wouldn't have been able to take this picture and mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to make this picture. And so I, I really like the celebration of the craft that, that's in this shot for me. I also like when you mentioned Hamilton specifically and some of the really great looking buildings that you get a little bit of that as well in it. Yeah. 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 I, well, James North is just full of fantastic buildings, you know, and, and fantastic little stores and, and people and tableaus and stuff. Like there's a, uh, a guy named Angelo who uh, there's an alley just near one of the cafes that I hang out in called Synonym. Um, and he's uh, just painted this um, alley in Hamilton with these Mediterranean colors, like these sure. wild pinks and oranges and like it's beautiful, beautiful. And, uh, and I've taken some photographs for Angelo and, and given them to him and he's, you know, and he's, I just said, you know, Hey, you know, like, thank you for doing this. Cause it's just such a, a beautiful little slice of, uh, of life that you just wouldn't expect from a street like, uh, James North. But, you know, I just love discovering things like that and, and capturing things like that. So this is, uh, Hamilton, uh, on a, uh, a morning, uh, with the, I just really like the um, sensibility here of this is Hamilton Harbor uh, with the trains coming. This is where the GO train comes in. This is a CN line as well for a lot of the materials that used to come and still come in and out of the steel mills. You can see the skyscrapers of downtown Hamilton. Um, so this is, to me, a really nice capture of a moment in Hamilton that is kind of a, encapsulates a lot of what I like about the city. I like the industrial sense of the city. I like the nature. I like the drama. Uh, and so I would just, again, this is an iPhone shot um, in, in a 48 megapixel raw. So I could pull the detail out of the shadows. Um, and I just loved making this picture and, and, and you know, increasing the, um, drama of the clouds. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in pulling the most out of an image. I don't, you know, I've experimented, uh, with some work that I did for uh, a friend of mine. Um, I've experimented with generative AI, uh, and it's got tremendous, tremendous potential, uh, but not for my work. And like, I don't want to use it for any of my work, my work. I don't erase anything. I enhance things in terms of tonality and stuff, but I don't get rid of, get rid of stuff. Um, but it's, you know, so this is an a, a image that I just really like, cause it was, this is the way it, in my mind, this is the way it looked. And I, mm -hmm. I'm really pleased with how I, I could make the picture look what I imagined it could be. Right. Awesome. So, yeah. So when you're talking about not, um, you know, taking anything out, like not even, um, content to wear fill or anything like that. Like you have like one branch that sticks out there. Well, I, that just stay in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's really important that you, you capture what's there. And I could say, I mean, the generative AI stuff is breathtaking. You know, like what you can do with it um, is, you know, like I, I took some photographs of some uh, women for a friend of mine who's a painter and wants to use them. Uh, he's it for in, in, interested in the Boston school of painting. And so he wanted to have some, reference work and so as an experiment um we took pictures of uh, the women in a cafe a staircase cafe and in some of the shots i just got generative ai to replace it with a completely different scene and it was amazing like holy heck, was it 
you know, like I just thought this is stunningly great for him for reference. Um, and he was super happy with it. But, you know, also from a photographer point of view, kind of scary because you can see where it's going, right? Like right. I could have said, replace the background. Okay, now replace the face. Now replace the body. Now you got a whole other photograph, right? And I can see that a lot of commercial photographers, fashion photographers, product photographers are going to be really scared of that technology because it's not there yet. I mean, Mid Journey is doing some astonishing things and there are studios that are actually generating AI models and AI imagery for product and stuff. Uh, and it's not there yet, but another year, maybe less, it will be. And that's really scary, right? I was thinking about that too, in terms of um, you know, the relevance of photography. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we will lose some of the market share in terms of, like you said, product photography. We were talking earlier, sports photography, fashion photography, maybe. But uh, there's also the process of photography itself is very meditative and it's very immersive. Mm -hmm. And as a human being, as long as human beings exist, photography will exist as an exercise for ourselves to do, regardless of what the output is, I think. Yeah, and, and it is very meditative. And, you know, I think of, of all the things that I'm interested in, it's it's the space where I can go into the zone the easiest, right? Like I can disappear into working on images for, you know, one or two hours and not know that the time's gone by. Like I'm just so into the process and it's it's become such a muscle memory and so gestural for me that it, it really is meditative and all consuming. Like I just love love focusing on it and it you know it's a very calming thing and i think you know for the next next few years anyway the the output is it, it's going to show in the output that that um human touch that our, our i would i don't want to say artisanal because it sounds like you're making bread but you know that that sort of craftsmanship i think shows in images and they that doesn't show in um, the stuff that I've seen coming out of Mid Journey or you know, Stable Diffusion or are these other tools. I, I think there's a, a human touch that's that's there and a moment that's captured that only comes from living a life in the real world, which is certainly not what a generative AI or you know a Chad GPT can can manufacture or or fabricate, right? We um where where we mentioned glass a fair bit, but where can people find you? Find your work. Where can they see it? Where can they get a hold of you? Um, you can go to waitandsee.com. That's the, uh, my company. Um, that I I try to do uh, emerging media uh, consulting for groups that are interested in um, just sort of pushing the edges of what they can do, or or doing some sort. Of, traditional stuff like I do podcasting for Harrismith magazine uh, and rabble.ca um, and you can if you're interested in my work it's on glass uh, it's Wayne and Hamilton on glass uh, and that's where I put the stuff you know I years years and years ago decades ago I had my stuff on Flickr uh, and I love that community I was on Instagram for a little while until it just turned into a, a junk drawer um, and so glass I find a really great community. Uh, I just, I've learned so much on glass and I've found so many uh, very positive people uh, on glass that are, are, provide really good commentary on my work. And, and I try to provide some commentary on their work. It's just a terrific place. So that's where I'm spending most of my, my photographic time in social media is in a, a very safe place like glass. And that's where, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Wayne, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule today to come talk with us and to show us some of your work and to talk about your process and the stories you're telling. And uh, uh, excited to learn about you. And uh, I can't wait to to see what you what you find yourself up to moving forward. Hey, TJ, thanks so much for having me. I really I really enjoyed our conversation and I appreciate the time you took. Same. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh